Hey everybody, this is Neil, and welcome to chapter 16 of Three Books, where we are on an epic quest to uncover the 1,000 most formative books in the world by interviewing and discussing what three books most shape the lives of 333 inspiring people. We have talked to everyone from chapter four, Sarah Ramsey, to chapter nine, Dave Barry, to chapter 14, Rich Gibbons, chapter 15, Mitch Album, and now chapter 16, Mitchell Kaplan. But before I introduce Mitchell, Mitch, then Mitchell, chapter 15, Mitch, chapter 16, Mitchell, um, what's next? M- Michismo? I know, I'm just kidding. There's no other Mitch connotation coming. Um, but before I get into Mitchell's story, let's talk about the number 1,000 for a second, okay? A few people have been saying to me, kind of like, Neil, why are you so obsessed with this number 1,000? Uh, well, I'll tell you why. Here's why, okay? Um, the average person lives for 1,000 months, period. Like, the average person lives for 1,000 months. That's that's the average lifespan, okay? 1,000 months. I'll let you do the math on years. I'll leave it as a little puzzle, but you can do the math. Um, and the average... A uh, person is awake for a thousand minutes a day. So not only are you alive for a thousand months, you also are awake for a thousand minutes every single day. That's partly why I started a blog called 1000 Awesome Things uh, about 10 years ago. And I wrote a thousand awesome things for four years in a row. It became my 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 first book. And now partly why I'm on this quest with you to uncover the 1,000 most formative books in the world. Why am I obsessed with the number? Because it is um, like flow, like like Michal Csikszentmihalyi describes this word called flow, a, a high skill and a high challenge thing that you do. That's that's the definition. Um, a thousand is kind of like that for me um, because a thousand is really big. It, it's really high. It takes a long time to do it, yet it is achievable. You, you could probably run a thousand races. You could probably do a thousand workouts. You could probably read a thousand books. And that's what takes us all the way back down to a beautiful Art Deco building uh, in Coral Gables, Florida, where we sit inside the independent bookstore chain, Books and Books, with Mitchell Kaplan. Why do we sit down with Mitchell? Because he started the chain, okay? Back in the early 1980s, pre-Miami Vice, pre kind of like a a Miami kind of uprising, Mitchell started a 500-square-foot bookstore. Um, He was passionate about community. He was passionate about place. He has a deep philosophical underpinning underneath his life's work. Um, And there is actually this amazing phrase that he says, I'm going to start leaving you guys with a magic phrase, like pay attention for this one. This phrase is, the older you get, the more you realize that's all there is to life. Wait till you hear what he's describing as the ultimate purpose of life and why his chain really start, starts that. But it's not just a chain, okay? He's now grown this store. And I mean, it gets the store gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's got rooms dedicated just to publishers. It's got an outdoor magazine stand. It's got 600 author events a year. That's like on average, two a day. The day I went down there, he was having two that day, like one at five, one at like 7.30. I'm like... You know, you you probably you may remember if you listen to it um, in chapter nine. Dave Barry, a famed comedy writer, Dave Barry says, I, "I come here all the time. Like we're always coming here to events. We're always buying books. Like it's become a third place for a lot of people." And he defines what third place means and what the origin is because he's so well read and he's an amazing, amazing guy. He's also used books and books to expand into the Miami Art Fair, which is an annual event that brings in six hundred authors and over four hundred thousand people into Miami, run out of Miami Dade College every single year. Um, Books and Books has grown. Um, You also may remember that chapter six of three books was recorded inside a a Books and Bookstore down in Key West, Florida, owned and operated by none other than Judy Bloom. So yes, Judy Bloom and Mitchell Kaplan are business partners. Um, Judy Bloom's store is a nonprofit down in Key West, and Mitchell Kaplan jokes that his store is just a no profit. But this man is wealthier than mo- most of us and many of us will ever be. And I'm not just talking about money. I am talking about true wealth, truly rich, living a rich, deep life full of meaning and purpose and people and relationships and deep connections. It is a soulful conversation and a passionate conversation. The books he brings up are eye-opening, and I hadn't read any of them. And I, I'm so desperate to tell you about them, but I don't want to ruin the surprise. And the only other thing I will say before I lead into Mitch uh, Mitchell, Mitchell's chapter 15, Mitchell's chapter 16, is 
Um, I apologize for the first five or so minutes of this podcast because I pressed record and then Mitchell started asking me questions. So there's a little bit of a reverse interview thing happening at the beginning. If you're bored of listening to me, just skip the first few minutes. If you're not, then you'll hear a side of me that I was unprepared to talk about as soon as Mitchell started asking. But I just left it on the tape because I always just try to leave it all on the tape. People, welcome back to Three Bucks and welcome into Chapter 16. I hope you enjoy this show. So you're a writer who does podcasts. What else do you do? Oh, and I just pressed record. Are you oh, okay you with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So I'm a writer who does podcasts. What else do I do? I um, this is a funny way to start, but we'll just start with this. I uh, I give a lot of speeches. I speak probably 50 times a year. I I'm uh, r- always writing. So I've got you to speak on positivity. Yeah, on, yeah. On, I've given a couple on, TED talks, and from there I've done. Uh, full length keynote speeches about happiness and positivity and how do how do you specifically you know my stuff isn't motivation it's application i'm not a i'm not a why speaker i'm not like a big thinker i'm a how speaker i'm like how does the average person take five little tricks in their pocket that they can actually do to begin some of the practices that we know from research truly work and so what motivated you i mean what did this come from a dark place this search for happiness or was it or did you grow up as a happy kid it's just like a reverse interview. I like it. Um, my wife left me and my best friend took his own life in the oh, span of a very short time. Man. And that uh, in 2000, over 2008, 2009, prompted me to begin writing a blog called 1000awesomethings.com uh, where every single day for a thousand straight weekdays, I wrote about something to cheer myself up before I went to bed. So for a thousand straight weekdays at 12 one a.m., I published an awesome thing like... Um, flipping to the cold side of the pillow in the middle of the night or getting called up to the dinner buffet first at a wedding. So it forced you to find good things to happen because you didn't want to get to that time. I had 12 awesome things when I started. Exactly. But then at the end, I had hundreds and thousands because people were submitting to me. I was looking for them. And then the book of awesome that you're holding right now is is a, a pull from that blog into a book which prompted well, and the you blog wrote that and the when? when did it come out i wrote the blog from 2008 to 2012 the book of awesome is 2010 the book of even more awesome 2011 book which of is Holiday amazing awesome because now we're in 2018 mm-hmm. and the whole notion of living in the moment the whole notion of um of slowing things down is now coming into fruition in a way or coming into the forefront in a way that it wasn't as much then, I don't think. Well, totally. And you know, Mitchell, like I always use this metaphor. Um, people, everyone you know, probably has a little plastic card in their wallet that costs them $50 a month. And it's the right to work out at a gym, right? So we all have this idea that like our physical health is so important that it's worth paying a monthly slash annual fee right. for to have permission to talk about. We go do cardio at lunch. We go blast some weights before we go to bed. No one's got the equivalent yet. We're just starting into that of like the mental side of personal well-being. So is this a medication-free approach to well-being? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not, uh, I don't have, I'm, I'm agnostic on medication, but but my stuff is about cultivating positive mindset. Oh, well, and, that's so important. And I think this podcast fits into that world. So, you know, we're talking about three books. You know, as well as I do, that reading yeah. creates health and creates well, happiness. what's funny is when you ask me to do it, I had to make, you know, I tend toward a little bit more of the, not dark, but toward more of the ponderous kinds of things that that have influenced me over the years. Maybe, maybe dark is the right word. But um, it made me really think about those things that moved me in the, at the time that I read them. Formative. They, well, I don't know how much they form me because... They they were on the road to being formative. They weren't the most formative things, but they somehow dovetailed with what was going on in my life at the time, which probably came from other places as well. Uh, you know, you I've heard you joke in the past, and you're not in the nonprofit business, you're in the no-profit business. You've been listening to me. I have been listening time. to you. You have a beautifully listenable voice, and you have eight bookstores under this Books and Books um, I won't use the word empire, but it's a large number of stores for an independent bookstore yeah, chain, right? Usually but they're, they're small. 
They're small. Uh, other <laughs> than this one, we're in a 10,000 square foot store right now with a Smaller cafe and a that. restaurant. Believe it or not, it's not really? that big. Yeah. Oh. Without the courtyard, it's about four and a half, uh, 4,500 square feet. And can I just say your courtyard has a magazine rack. And I, I, I don't know if I've ever been into a bookstore in my life independent or not independent that has an outdoor magazine rack i always love those uh, you know I, I i used to love visiting new york and going to outdoor newsstands yeah so we have two of the stores have outdoor we have another store in miami beach that yeah. also has an outdoor newsstand i saw a, a group of like probably eight ladies eating salads talking about red notice right. their book club was here yeah we People do that. Are walking in and out they're grabbing salad this feels yeah. like not just a bookstore this feels like a like a train station like there's action here there's bustle well community center is what a bookstore ought to be and that is what we've always tried to be was that place which is known as a third place after work after home yeah you go to Howard Schultz third, talk about that with Starbucks. You go to your third place. Right. It was, believe it or not, that was came from a book called A Great Good Place. Ah. And the book was written by a guy named Ray Oldenburg. And I would have put that in here, but it was a little too recent. But that book, he was a professor at, at a small college, which has gotten bigger, called the University of Northern Florida. And Ray Oldenburg was a sociologist who came up with this idea. A great good place. Of the third place. Ah. Of a great good place. And that has been the thing that has always fueled everything that I do is to create a place. So when you ask, are we about selling books? We are, but we're really more about place, about creating a space for people to feel comfortable in, to enjoy themselves, to meet other people, to have podcasts in, to talk, to explore, to argue. That's what we're all about. I, I, is that how you define third place? Uh, as that sense, that I you think said? so, yeah. yeah. Third place is After that, work and after home, After right? work, after home, mm-hmm. you go somewhere where you can hang out. So it used to be beauty parlors or, or uh, barber shops or bars or, you know, those uh, luncheonettes, you know, any of those places where people meet. It's the old idea of cheers, you know, yeah. the whole idea of the bar that, you know, you'll meet your next friend or you'll have a bunch of friends. The wacky guy that's just sort of always in the corner. and Perhaps. But, yeah. you know, you epitomize community here. And um, there's a lot of talk in the world that like, community has almost become a business buzzword. I dare to say that, but it's become like right. everyone wants it's to form weaponized. a community, a tribe. And we have communities online. You are you you've created one you have 600 events here a year you have people bustling in and out you've got a staff that's tight it's a beautiful place how do you define community how do you create community well the the very first thing to do is it has to be authentic and it cannot be manufactured because people realize that when it's manufactured it's manufactured so community is really about define well, authentic that. by authentic, it has to, it has to, it has to. It's almost. It's words are very hard to define authentic in terms of a place like a bookstore. It doesn't mean that it has to be, you know, fancy or expensively built. You just know it when you feel it. You walk in and you go, Ah, I'm here mm-hmm. somewhere where I can just sit down and read or have a cup of coffee and look out and maybe I'll run into somebody that will be very interesting for me. Or it can also be a space that's programmed and it's programmed as we do with authors, with lectures, with we allow the ACLU to meet here, Amnesty International meets here. So we want it to be a a free space as well that the community feels a part of. So really... You know, it's it's hard. But but I think the biggest thing is, for me, in terms of what's happened is, this is something we've been doing for 36 years. So it started out that way. It was not something that we cynically tried to do in order to draw people. To be really, really frank, I grew up in Miami and I had moved away. And I wanted to open up a place that I would like to be in. Nah. And that would attract people that I could then become friendly with that would keep me here in Miami. And it has done just that because I was on my way into other, I was leaving Miami yet again when I opened up the bookstore. You know, the selfish motive is sometimes the purest and most authentic. I, I want to read a thousand 
formative books from 333 inspiring right. people, hence this podcast. And you wanted a place that you could hang out. And so frankly, since I've been here a few hours ago, you've been hanging out here. I've been watching you <laughs> chat with everybody so far. We've been chatting for a few minutes. Seven people have walked by. You just keep waving at them like this. You've, you've made it, man. This is it. You've done the thing that you wanted I'm to very, do. I'm really lucky. Not only that, but I have a, yeah. I have a wonderful art cinema right across That's the street. That's your place? I took no, a picture. It's of- not mine, oh. but they're there. And yeah, I get yeah. to utilize it. And there's an amazing bike store right down the block, so oh, I can go in I there. I took a picture of the Wes Anderson Review, yeah, and I was like, this is my kind of place with a Wes oh, Anderson no, Review. I'm, I'm actually on the board of this cinema, but they're a great place. And actually, you know, one of the things I've done, the other thing that I've done is try to find value in what I'm doing or take what I'm doing and express it in different ways. So I've, I've started to make movies, and I was able to show one of our films across the street. Wow. It's called The Man Who Invented Christmas wow. about Charles Dickens and the writing of a Christmas carol. Oh my gosh. And our and our production company is all based on books into film. So we have a new one coming out called The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, which is a book about books and book clubs. And that's coming out in April in Europe and it'll be on Netflix in the United States in june starring lily james and mike newell directed it who did four weddings and a funeral oh wow that's amazing and you created the i think if not the then one of the largest book fairs in the country as well yeah the miami book fair is great is it it's, the largest one one of the largest well it's how you define it yeah, but we think yeah. it's it's spectacular it's yeah. got 600 authors that come over a week wow and we get two three four hundred thousand people who come holy it's cow. based at miami dade college and it's a phenomenal fair. And we've been, this is our 35th book fair. Talk about community. There's an example with an event, you know, and, um, and also the place you just define. You know, I interviewed Seth Godin for this podcast. He lives in Hastings on Hudson, north of New York City. And he talked about the bakery his wife runs kind of down the block, the vinyl store across the street, the sort of Galapagos bookstore across the street. He's like, he's got a little place. And having a special place is beautiful. It's part of life. Well, the older you get, the more you realize that that's all there is to life. What there is to life is a sense of meaning that you get from people, from places, from relationships. Nothing else really means much, mm-hmm. you know. Um, uh, happiness, love. What do you? How do you get those things? You get it from real things, not from manufactured things. So, you know, that's really. So, you want to do something essential in your life and. One of the things you can do is you can act as a, as a connector for people and ideas and that sort of thing. It's kind of, I never imagined it when I was a student, but there is a producer high that one gets when they create something and you put it into motion and then things, surprising things happen that you're not uh, expecting. So that's kind of what, yeah. that's kind of where I've gone. And the book fair exemplifies that beautifully because Miami is so diverse as a city yeah. that the whole idea of the book fair from the beginning was to be a gigantic tent under which everybody in the community can operate under and by doing what the way we did that is by inviting authors that were as diverse as you could possibly imagine that would appeal to all kinds of authors and what's happened over the 35 years is there's been this incredible kind of um uh coming together of these diverse communities and through literature where, you know, uh, uh, a white Jewish housewife is reading Edvige Dantecott, you know, who's a young Haitian writer. Hmm. And, you know, so all of these people discovered one another through books. Diversifying their own thoughts. Diversifying thoughts, feeling empathy, understanding what goes on. And and I think that is our resistance to what's happening in the world right now. Yeah, is to develop empathy among people totally. so that they can see unempathetic people and call them out almost immediately. Ah, love, community, belonging, fitting in—a perfect segue to your first book, which is called "Black Like Me" by John Howard Griffin. This is a series of nonfiction diary entries that were written over the course of six weeks in 1959. John Howard Griffin, who was Texan, born and raised, lived from 1920 to 1980, did something bizarre, maybe you'd consider, in 1959. He went and saw a dermatologist in New Orleans and said, make me black. 
taking a prescription of medication, exposing himself to UV lights for 15 hours a day for a series of days until he and shaved his head until he looked black. He then spent six weeks traveling through Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, and Georgia with this new perspective. These journal entries, nonfiction entirely, were originally published in Sepia magazine with the title Journey into Shame, and then they were published in 1961 by Houghton Mifflin. 50th anniversary edition of this book, which, by the way, I had never heard of till you recommend it. I'm so glad you told me to read it. It's a phenomenal book. Came out in 2011 by Signet, if I'm saying that right, or Signet? Yeah, Signet, Division Signet. of uh, Penguin. Division of Penguin. And and this is the 188-page journal of describing race relations through the perspective of a white person who's colored themselves black, um, which we can we can speculate on whether that be sort of appropriate or not today. But either way, after he came back, his his book came out and rendered him uh, both fans who said that it exposed him to many different experience, a, a different view of of what life is like in America from the perspective of, of black people. And it also um, created danger for his family. And he actually had to move to Mexico for a time for safety because he was an effigy was created of him. He was severely beaten by the Ku Klux Klan at one point. Um, this book changed his life substantially and many other lives, including your own. Tell us about your relationship with black like me. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the book was published in 1961. I was six years old. So I didn't really get to the book until a few years later when, when I was in about fifth grade, I think, I had a teacher, a kind of remarkable teacher um, named Fran Schmidt. Fran Schmidt taught me in both fifth and sixth grade. In those days, that was probably 1964, in 65, Florida? in Miami yeah. Beach, where I'm from. And what what... What she was all about was about social justice. And so she would have mock UNs. She was against the war. She would talk about that. Miami Beach in those days when I was growing up was, I would say, primarily a Jewish, white neighborhood, uh, a little bit on the elderly side. The busing hadn't really started yet. So we came... Uh, we came in contact with the black community, not very much living on South Miami Beach at the time. And so I think what Fran was trying to do was to broaden our horizon to help understand, because the civil rights movement was in full swing in 63, 64, and I think she wanted Martin us, Luther King. Well, yeah, it was yeah. the, the, the yeah. March on Selma, you know, all that sort of stuff had already happened and was in the beginning of happening and then the cities would erupt. But she wanted the, these group of fifth graders to be sensitized to what the black experience was. Wow. And in those days, a book like this, which today might seem um, like cultural appropriation or something like that, maybe not very politically correct, where we had to view the black experience through the eyes of a white man, um, those issues weren't really at all even kind of brought up. Instead, in a very kind of innocent, raw way, I was given this book, read it, and blown away by just what was happening around me and around all of us in the South at the time. And it made me more aware when I watched the civil rights thing go on. My father happened to be a very sort of liberal, I came from a very liberal progressive family. So these were discussions that we were having every night. But this this brought it home in a way that abstract discussion just didn't. In Black Like Me, he talks about bumping into people he knows, of course, who did not recognize him, and them giving him like the right. hate stare. But yeah, you what's know? interesting so much is it wasn't so much... It, what he did, the fact that he dyed his skin color and all that, that's not really what stayed with me because I read it as if he were black. Mm -hmm. You know, I read it as if I was reading the work of a black man as a young boy. I didn't, it wasn't like here's someone dressed up, you know, trying to make believe. The interesting to, thing to me was the discovery of that happening, of that somebody giving him a hate stare mm -hmm. or even worse in terms of that. Because to remember around that time you also had, you know, you had 
the KKK going after SNCC and you had, you don't remember it, but there were all kinds of things happening. SNCC. And as, uh, the student, uh, student nonviolent coordinating committee mm. and they were the freedom riders and they were involved with the freedom riders and all of that was swirling around in a nine year old's brain. Mm -hmm. So this helped focus it in a way that other things hadn't at the time. Who should read this book? Um, today i mean it's interesting i think you know the, the the canon now doesn't include this as much anymore because you have the work of james baldwin you know you have the work of so many other people who experienced it so directly that you know even reading some of the comics today of congressman john lewis that he's been doing you know, on this experience. So this maybe is a little bit of a kind of a social document of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and it may not be as um, as moving mm. in, you know, to people reading it. I haven't read it yeah. since that time. So I don't know how I would experience it. But I think you can give it to anyone uh, just about now, anyone who might seem to you to be a, li a bit naive about what's going on in the world. Yeah. Uh, someone who maybe isn't a sophisticated reader of black literature mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Because it's who, super accessible. It's very like, accessible. Like someone who's slow someone, like me who's like captivated yeah. by the sim it's well, some, simple. Someone who might not want to read James Baldwin, but may, this may be more palatable. James to Baldwin them. has a famous book that you're, are you referring to something specific? Oh, just all of his work. Okay. You know, I mean, all of his work. Yeah, I don't, I'm know. not. Uh, you're not familiar with him? At, yeah. At, I, we have a thing on our show. It's called No Book Shame, No Book Guilt. We, oh, we, no, don't, don't. We talk about this a lot because there's well, then, always. This yeah. is what I'm going to suggest then. Yeah. Beyond the book, there's a marvelous documentary that just came out called I, I, I Am Negro, mm. and it's about the life of James Baldwin. Okay. So try to see Thank that you. documentary. I appreciate it. And uh, true authenticity as a bookseller is when you advise a different medium <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to a book in your own store. Um, you left Miami, right? You you grew up, You I believe you went to Boulder, Colorado. I did. Uh, I went to University of Colorado. And you, I think I heard you say in a previous interview that you got a little bit more familiar with the Beat Poets there because they set up some institution uh, in Boulder. Yeah, they had a thing called the Naropa Institute. And uh, the Naropa Institute was formed by uh, Rinpoche yeah. and Allen Ginsberg. Ah. And the Naropa Institute started about the same year that I went to University of Colorado. So it was, I didn't go there because of it. I'd never yeah. heard of that institute. And they also had this thing, a writing group within it called, I love it, the Jack Kerouac School for Disembodied Poetics. And that was... Because the Beats, you know, Kerouac was such a seminal member of the Beat generation. But it was a book by the Beats, which is one of the books I gave you, which got me out to Colorado in the first place. Yeah. And it's called The Dharma Bums yeah. by Kerouac. Exactly. And so, so this is your second book, The Dharma Bums by Jack Ker right. Kerouac. If I, I'm just going to do like a, a 30 second for those listening who have not heard of this book. Sure. Before. It's written in 1958. It's a novel uh, by Jack Kerouac. It's the basis for, sorry, the basis for the novel, semi-fictional accounts are events occurring after the events of On the Road, his sort of more famous book. The main characters are the narrator Ray Smith, based on Kerouac, and Jaffe Ryder, based on poet and essayist Gary Snyder, who was instrumental in Kerouac's introduction to Buddhism in the 1950s. The book concerns duality in Kerouac's life and ideals, examining the relationship of the outdoors, mountaineering, hiking, and hitchhiking through the West U.S. with his city life of jazz clubs, poetry readings, and drunken parties. The protagonist's search for a Buddhist context to his experience recurs throughout the story. This book, The Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac, had a significant influence on the hippie counterculture of the 1960s. So please, Mitchell, sorry for that aside. I well, just want to give context. But so, so the, the Tell idea, us about your relationship. Yeah, the idea of this book is... So here I am now, after being nine years old in fifth grade, I'm in uh, 10th grade or 11th grade, I can't remember, but I'm either 15, 16 years old. And, you know, I was taking English classes and reading things on my own. So we're talking about 1970. The beats were the 50s into the early 60s. So I was a little bit looking backward. Um, but I was living on Miami Beach, of all places at the time, which is a palm tree, mm -hmm. 
you know, everyone knows Miami Beach. At the time, it wasn't the Miami Beach that it is today. At the time, the median age was 68. The baby boom period was in full swing, but they were closing down elementary schools on Miami Beach for lack of kids. So it was a fair, I felt like I was completely out of place living in this strange world of Miami <laughs> Beach. You and a whole bunch of old people. Well, not just me, but there were a bunch of older people and me and yeah. a bunch of younger people. But I always felt like I was sort of in a different place and time. So I was reading the Dharma Bums. And I, and I had all, I, I was sort of always loved poetry and, you know, that sort of thing. And I'd never been to mountains, never seen snow. I had only lived in Miami, basically. Went to summer camp in a kind of mountainous area in northern North Carolina but really hadn't been in winter much. And so I read the Dharma Bums, and here's this character, Gary, this Gary Snyder character, you, you will resonate with this, where who's finding happiness sitting on mountaintops, looking for fires while he's watching, uh, while he's writing poetry. And I thought, wow, what a great life that is. And it, it was so exotic to me that as soon as I started looking at colleges, I thought I got fixated with Colorado, even though this doesn't take place in Colorado, it takes place on the Oregon coast. Uh, I didn't really put, the, to me, Oregon and Colorado <laughs> yeah, were one enough. and the same. And I read it, loved it so much that I said, yeah, you know, I'm going to go to Colorado. And it was in those days before college tours. Wow, this book, cha- this book decided where you went to school. I didn't catch that. Yeah, first time. pretty okay. much, pretty much. Wow. And... I, uh, well, I decided I wanted to lead more pastoral life than I was leading. And I wanted to head out, head west. And I wanted to be on the road, in essence. And in those days, you could. It was before cell phones, before all that stuff, before GPSs. Nobody knew where I was. And I literally, and it was before college tours. To this day, I don't think my parents even still know where I went to college. <laughs> but, you know, so I just headed west. And the very first day, I was under such misconception of what mountains were like that when I heard that it was a mile high city in Denver, I thought it was almost like on a bluff a mile high. Oh, yeah. And there'd be a railing around it. You'd look <laughs> down like the Grand Canyon. Something like the uh, Cloud City and uh, Empire yeah, Strikes yeah, Back. Exactly right. And I remember my first snowfall, my professor there knew that I was from Miami and saw that all I was doing was looking out the window and he let me, he said, okay, you can go and let me just wow. go and leave class. And Since you're so infatuated with outside this classroom, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Frolic. That's exactly what he did. So you talk about your book of the moments. Those are moments that I will never forget. Um, and, but the book itself also, uh, you know, it talks about the considered life the quieter life, you know, a time when what we have to do is look at nature, you know, think thoughts that are essential mm-hmm. and not necessarily just be concerned with all the material things that we all get caught up in. Even the cover invokes that feeling. It's, it's a yeah. pink, it's almost like a pink you know, background sunset with a green this tree. Is, this is a cover that I haven't seen before, actually. Oh, really? And I... Um, I, they've done so many different covers on this, but I have a, you know, I, I got so, so crazy about it that I got a first edition hardcover copy of it and, um, it still resonates. With if you'd me. like to complete your, uh, uh, Dharma bum collection, I'm very happy to give that to you. No, 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 no. You're no, a bookseller. No. So the least Keep I can it. do. No, I'm sure we have it. I just haven't looked. <laughs> I love that, that explanation of how formative the Dharma bums was to your life. And, um, what if we could just go to your third book now? You know, this one is different than the other two for sure. And it is called uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business, published, or sorry, written by Neil Postman in 1985. Um, on the back, it says, more relevant than ever, the prophetic landmark work exploring the corrosive effects of electronic media on a democratic society. Um, I'm just going to read the first paragraph here because it's it's so relevant today. By the way, it's the only book I've ever seen with the, with the blurb by Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons. The blurb says, all I can say about Neil Postman's brilliant, amusing ourselves to death is guilty as charged. <laughs> um, so here's the back. Uh, Television has habituated us to visual entertainment measured out in spoonfuls of time. 
But what happens when we come to expect the same things from our politics and public discourse? What happens to journalism, education, and religion when they too become forms of show business? 20 years ago, and this obviously this publication is 2005, so more like 30 years ago, Neil Postman's lively polemic, if I said that right, yeah, was the polemic. first polemic was the first book to consider the way electronic media were reshaping our culture. And this is like before like smartphones. Even the back of this book is written before iPhones. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, and even and even just page eight of this book says. I'm going to read this quote. As I write this book, the president of the United States is a former Hollywood actor. And I was like, but he doesn't know about Donald Trump, but he's talking about Ronald Reagan. This book seems like it was written today. That's why I Amusing that's ourselves why I included to death. It. Tell us about your it's, relationship with this book. Yeah, well, I came across that book when I was a bookseller. It was written in 1985 or published in 85. I opened the first store in 82. So this, I was Is young, this the one that we're in? Are we in was, that? No, the, okay. I, we moved here okay. in, in 99, but we were across the street. So that book was a book that I discovered as a bookseller. And I'd always been sort of a political kid. Couldn't stand Ronald Reagan. I thought, I think to this day, I think that the discourse we see today is a direct link to him. Um, and this book, this book explained to me so much of... Um, of, of what brought Reagan to the fore. Mm -hmm. And also I took it as a warning of a warning shot. Uh, I could never imagine where we were today, but yeah. it was an incredible warning shot for the future. And, and when you put it in context, you understand how brilliant it is because this was a book written at the dawn of cable television. Cable TV was just starting. All basically. they had to talk about was TV. We, they well, weren't even complaining that, about the was, internet yet. No, but the only the only thing what he was complaining about was CNN. Mm. He was complaining about the CNN quick news cycle. He wasn't even complaining about what we see on Fox and everywhere else. So what he was really talking about and what he what he saw back then was the 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 potency of of distraction when it came to politics and and being able to distract people with slick ideas i mean slick words controlling slick phrases, the news cycle controlling the news cycle um pitting people against one another you know that whole idea of what's the matter with kansas the idea that people will vote against their self-interests you know sure that's what, what do you mean the whole about. the kansas thing Oh, there's a book called What's the Matter with Kansas, which is a fabulous book that I'm sure someone will bring up to you at some, at some <laughs> point. But what this guy did was, uh, Thomas Frank, he went and he checked out uh, the poorest district in the country, the poorest congressional district, happened to be in Kansas. And, and that's why he calls it What's... What, and they voted, they always voted red. They always voted for Republicans. They voted against their self-interest, more or less. And he wanted to find out why. And the reason why they did was because they were being manipulated by their, uh, you know, the religious uh, teachers and whatever. They were anti-gay, anti-abortion. They were using social issues to kind of control them in a way. I don't mean it. I don't mean control, control, but they were using those issues mm. to influence the political discourse so that they would overlook the fact that they were poor, that they had no real power, all of those kinds of things. That was the so Dave so, Chappelle has a brand new special on Netflix where he talks about what he calls the poor whites coming up to vote for Trump. He goes on this huge rant. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a you recommended a film to me, so I'll recommend the new Dave Chappelle oh, special I'll have to, to you. Look at that. Um, and it's related to the themes of this book. Yeah, I uh, know it's this book. That's why you have Matt Groening. Yeah. I mean, there's a new book that just came out called Bad Stories which picks up from this guy named Steve Allman, just wrote that. And so you've got people all across generations who are fans of this book. And I picked it up as a hardcover. I still have the one that wow. I bought originally. Wow. And I read it at the moment, and I think I've probably given away more than I've sold, to be <laughs> honest. It's, uh, unfortunately, Neil Postman died. But ironically, when I was reading The Dharma Bums in high school, I read a book called Teaching as a Subversive Activity, and Neil Postman was one of the writers of that book Wow! as well. That was in the 70s where he was criticizing our educational system and talking about how teachers needed 
to be have more of a social consciousness and where teachers needed um to actually uh get in there and see what they were doing as part of a larger uh, which they do now today, a larger social context. If I had to choose another book, it wouldn't be that one, but it was another book written by a guy named Jonathan Kozol, who wrote a book at the time that had an immense in, uh, impact on me called, um, um, oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting. That's I'm okay. Blank on it. It's Jonathan Co- uh, It's a book about, Jonathan Kozol taught in the Boston Public Schools and it was about uh, teaching, and yeah. that also had, an, it had a great title. We can both would put the, die in the title. Yeah, we can both put the link of the title of that book in the show notes for this episode, so people yeah. will catch it if they want to look it up. But also, if it, we'll talk about something else, and it might pop back to you. Yeah. But you know what the thing is? Say this book is right. Say we are amusing ourselves to death. Say we are making entertainment the overwhelming decision point on on all these things, like on politics, on you know how we think about education, how we think about religion, how we think about journalism. Then what? Then what, Mitchell? Like, what's the? This is, book's written in 1985. If anything, things in this the book describes have gotten worse. We're more distracted than ever. We have lower attention spans than ever. We're on our cell phones over four or five hours a day. They say our our attention spans now are under nine seconds, under that of the goldfish. I don't know if you heard that statistic come out recently. So say it's right. Now what? Now do we? You want me to come up with an answer? I want you to it? come up with an answer. Yes, I do. <laughs> Because you have a lot of sage wisdom, oh. you're you're voted one of, I believe, America's top bookseller. If I'm right, right, that right. Just you, means you, I you persevere. No, but, but you're, what do we do? What do we do? What well, do we do about it? What do we do about it? That's a really good question. The name of Jonathan Kozol's book it was called Death at an Early Age. Okay, and it was about basically the ineptitude of our educational system back in the '70s, and maybe that's really what we do about it. What we need to do is make sure that people, um, that we value education more than we value it today. How? And, well, you can start by... You're wagging your uh, glasses at me as you say, no, I like that. I just want to give people the visual. You you can start by um, by, uh, acknowledging that the teaching profession is an extremely important one. And you can start by paying people more who teach and encourage young people who are bright and interested to go into teaching. Um, you can start by giving public schools the money it needs, uh, the public schools the money they need in order to uh, have enough desks, enough books, enough, uh, you know, uh, the classroom uh, need to be rich and full. and Maybe less technology. Uh, maybe, That's a maybe debate, not. Right? It's a debate I mean, right technology now. Technology could work. I, I don't think it's a matter. I really don't. I think a lot of those things are out of the out of the box. In other words, I don't think you're going to put technology back in a box. Mm-hmm. I think it's the way we deal with it. It's the way it's having not being able. We need civic discourse that that is smart. That people understand what's going on and all of that. And actually. What I tell people is, and it's not just because from where I sit, but we have to develop, really develop, a generation of critical thinkers and critical readers. We have to, we have to really encourage the next generation of readers as much as we possibly can. And the way you do that is by just giving as much support as you can to that, uh, as much as we give to, I don't know, the military, or as much as we give to anything else, that you know we tend to, um, you know, we tend to support uh, wrongheadedly. You know, we don't need to give big tax cuts to people so that they can acquire more uh, companies or more things or more homes or more cars. We need to be able to redirect our resources in such a way as to allow people to eat give them comfortable housing, let them nourish their soul and their brain and their minds. I think I went on a rant. No, I I, I'm so, no, you should, <laughs> you should definitely should have done that because this podcast is called Three Books. We uh, are the only podcast in the world by and for book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. And I'll try to say librarians an octave lower, uh, the almighty, you know, if, if doctors are, um, you know, for our bodies and librarians and booksellers are for our minds. And my dad, by the way, came to Canada as a teacher 
And I asked him when I was a kid, why are all your Indian friends doctors? And you're the only teacher. All my Indian parents' friends are doctors. You're a teacher. And you know what he said to me, Mitchell? He said, in India, when I became a teacher, they got paid the same as doctors. Interesting. They Very valued education and health at the same level. Well, that's that's right. And and we're not all motivated by the by the dollar reward, but at least what we need to do is put it on the same plane so that uh, people understand how important teaching actually is. Exactly. I mean, look look at what's happening right now as we speak in Oklahoma, West Virginia. Teachers are going on strike. It's been an amazing thing to see because they usually didn't and um, and usually don't. So it's really, it, I, I, I think we're at a very special time in history, a very interesting time where things are being defined. Mm -hmm. And as they're being defined, People are choosing sides and understanding what core values really are and should be. And I think that's, what's ha that's what happens when you have a kind of demagogue in power. You know, you begin to define yourself to the demagogue. And I think that's what we're doing right now. Mm. Wise words. Uh, and we're going to close off right now with a few fast money round questions. I know your time is so valuable. I really appreciate you giving me not just your time, but also your, your physical space. If you could delete it from your brain... What book would you most want to read again for the first time? <laughs> That's a great question. When I was a little kid, really little, like a toddler, I was amazed by uh, The Red Balloon, the book. I don't know if you know it. I know it. I think it's I French. Know it. yeah. You know, it's a French book. They made a movie out of it as well. And I just couldn't get enough of that book. I would. I, it was like I was living in it and watching the little boy being carried off by the balloons at oh, the wow. end. And if I could do it again, I would want to experience that thrill, that unabashed thrill of being captured and caught in a book like that. Wow. Do you have a favorite bookstore other than this one, other than the ones you, you run? Well, I have, yeah, lots. Too many to mention okay. on okay. your podcast. However, I am really, really um, enamored. And what got me into this a lot were the bookstores, some of them no longer exist, the bookstores of the past, like, you know, the original Shakespeare and Company by Sylvia Beach. You know, that to me... Is that Paris? It was in Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is still Shakespeare and Company there, but it's thrown by somebody else mm -hmm. in a different place. But Sylvia Beach's Shakespeare and Company was had to have been this remarkable place, a place where Hemingway and Joyce and T.S. Eliot all sort of marched through. Is that the bookstore where if you write a one-page biography of yourself, they let you sleep there overnight? Yeah, that's the new one, the new uh -huh. Shakespeare and Company, yeah. You don't George, have the same policy here? Uh, no. <laughs> Although, <laughs> because just it's only because we don't have a bed. But... <laughs> But that bookstore was amazing. And then the Gotham Book Mart was also an amazing bookstore in New York City. And it had a wonderful little um a wonderful little sculpture outside of its outside of its door called and it, it said the word wise men fish here, which I always thought was great. Oh, I love that. And then you know, one that's so historic and so remarkable is Shakespeare and Com uh not Shakespeare and Company, but City Lights bookstore in San Francisco. Uh a bookstore you should go to and you should you should definitely interview Ferlin Getty. Maybe you can introduce who, me. Well, he just, I can introduce you the managers of the store. This was where the beats all hung out uh -huh. in San Francisco. But Ferlin Getty is 99 years old. Oh, wow. And he is the one who published Allen Ginsberg's Howl and all wow. that sort of stuff. So he's somebody that uh, I'd like to know what his three books are. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I think those, but I can tell you that there's a vast, group of bookstores that are just remarkable today in America and across the world that uh, are just kind of... Uh, Give us a couple shout outs. Spe spectacular. Well, I'd be afraid of leaving some people no, out, no, but no, there's but Square just, Books, and I'm just, this will be yeah. just off the top of my head, Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi, Book People in, uh, in Austin. Austin, Texas. There's the Boulder Bookstore in Boulder, Tattered Cover in Denver. In San Francisco, you've got a million Green Apple books. You've got, uh, there's, a, there's a bookstore called A Great Good Pla a Third Place Books oh. in, uh, in, outside of Seattle.
There is no better calling than being involved in the literary life. Do not be frightened by it, Mitchell says. And honestly, before starting this podcast, I was very frightened about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm a writer, but I mean, that took me like 10 years to even call myself that. Uh, or maybe 35 years, I should say, because I've been writing since I was a kid, but I never called myself that. But I'm also like, can I really start a podcast about books? I mean, I'm not even that well read. I can't even read big words. I don't even know, kind of like, pe- people are like, oh, yeah, have you read Jane Austen? Have you read, um, you know, uh, Charles Dickens? Have you read, uh, you know, Philip Roth? Have you read? And I'm like, no, I don't even know who this people. I don't even know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? So, so I was like super scared uh, of the literary life. And Mitchell's right. It is a life that is great and is full of art and beauty and connection. And if we can let ourselves be vulnerable and humble and honest with no book guilt and no book shame and asking the dumb questions, because we're all thinking of them, we're all wondering about them, then we can go on this journey together. And I am loving going on this journey with you. Thank you so much for listening to Chapter 16 of Three Books. And now, if you've made it to this far in the podcast, it's time to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. This is one of two clubs that we have for three books listeners. The other one is, of course, the secret club, which I can't say more about. But if you call us at one eight three three read a lot, you can maybe find out more. Um, by the way, when you're calling me one eight three three read a lot, I was trying to figure out ways to link the chapters together. You know, as we start getting more and more chapters, I'm like, do we put callbacks? You know, how how do we reference or, or connect the dots between the different shows? Um, I'd love your ideas and suggestions on that. Uh, how do we, because, you know, we're going to get 333. So how do we, uh, in chapter 177, which might be in, you know, 2027, <laughs> 20, it sounds like a crazy year, but it's a real year that's coming, 2027. Um, how do we call back to you know, chapter six with Judy Bloom or chapter 16 with Mitchell Kaplan. What are the best ways to thread the needle? Help me out. one 833 read a lot give me a call. And with that, let's go to the phones. Hey, Neil, this is Wish. Your best Uber driver in the world ever. You made it, Neil. Thanks very much. All this name, the new identity, the being famous, the three books podcast on our secrets of 4.99 reading, the customer service lessons were best Uber driver ever at Fast Company. The mention of me at Uber, Twitter, handle, Facebook, the UPS longitudes, numerous other blogs, Twitters, Facebook, LinkedIn pages, and so many other corporate sites to an FM radio interview. Wow. The most, most special was the speakers.ca, the world's greatest, greatest association of speakers. Without you, nothing would have been possible, Neil. Just a few months ago, a random Uber driver on streets of Toronto with no mentions anywhere. No one cared, not even Uber. It was just you who figured my 4.99 rating after 5,000 rides what was a big deal. No one ever asked me before how and why I was doing such a thankless job with that dedication. I'm ever grateful to God for giving the best ever Uber ride, the best ever Uber rider of my life, Neil Pashtricha. It has changed so much in my life. From nowhere to the top, the talk of the town started appearing on Google feeds of my wife and daughter. What a feeling, what a proud, what a space you provided me. Just in a few weeks, Neil, you took me from streets of Toronto to spotlights of the world. Honestly speaking, Neil, I would have had numerous accomplishments in past corporate roles of 18 years in top Indian corporates to Dubai and England, but nothing has given me the comparison of splash of life, of delight, the level of true happiness, what I'm getting now. Thank you, Neil. Once again, from the bottoms of my heart, me and my family and my friends would always be grateful to you and your family. May God bless you and your loved ones and ever in life. Thank you, Neil. This is Wish. Vishwa. Well, I guess that's one way to thread the episodes, thread the chapters together. Have past guests call in. Vish. Oh, man, I could listen to your voice all day. You are such a beautiful person, a beautiful soul. By the way, every time I get into an Uber, which is like, like I said, like twice a day, I'm addicted to Uber. 
um, you know, Leslie and I share one car and really uh, the car has the car seats in it. And so it's really kind of, she uses it more. So I'm like bouncing around on Uber. I'm always like talking to the driver. I'm like, oh yeah, 4.88, you're doing well, you're doing well. I'm like, but I do know a guy who's 4.99. And they're like, who, who? And I'm like, if they're interested, you know, 4.88s are kind of interested. 4.7s, they don't care. 4.92s, they really care. And then I, I share with them the show, the show. So you're spreading love and joy in my life too. Now, can we get uh, Frank Warren, if you're listening, give me a call. Seth Godin, if you're listening. Sarah Ramsey, if you're listening. Gretchen, Ruben, I know some of you guys are listening. Give me a call, one eight three three read a lot and let's hear from you. And now it's time for the review of the chapter. As you know, every time we read a a review of the chapter, and please leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts, over on Stitcher, um, Google Play, wherever you listen to your podcast, YouTube, that's fine. Um, Apple Podcasts is probably where more more of them congregate uh, and more of them listen to. That's where I listen to my podcast. Uh, then, then we pick one out and, and we mail you a free signed book. So th- it's worth your time. Okay, so here we go. Um, aspiring management consultant. That's an interesting handle. <laughs> um, he or she says, this podcast is awesome and more awesome. Can't wait for the moon to come. It's so frustrating, isn't it? Waiting for that moon. You can't affect it at all. It's one of the few things in life you just can't control. I have been hooked since chapter one. I really enjoy we get to explore three books with every person you interview. Um, it's even got me reading some PJ P.G. Woodhouse books because of the interview you did with Dave Barry. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. I especially enjoyed the interview with Vishwas Agarwal and the story of you getting in his Uber at the bar and everyone cheering. I don't think I ever laughed out loud before how excited someone was about getting an Uber. Keep doing what you're doing. Aspiring management consultant, thank you for the beautiful, heartfelt review. And I also hope you become a management consultant because don't we all have goals? Um, I was a management consultant once. I hope you do better at it than me. That's a story for another time. I failed miserably at that and many other jobs. And now it's time for the word of the chapter. What is the word of the chapter, Mitchell? Here it is. I think we're in a very special time in history, a very interesting time where things are being defined. And as they're being defined, people are choosing sides and understanding what core values really are and should be. And I think that's what's ha- that's what happens when you have a kind of demagogue in power. You know, you begin to define yourself to the demagogue. Yes, it is demagogue. D e m a g o g u e. Demagogue. According to Merriam Webster, it's a leader who makes use of popular prejudices and false claims and promises in order to gain power. I mean, I've been hearing this word a long time. You know, you kind of hear this word all the time. People call Trump a demagogue and people call Putin a demagogue. People call all kinds of leaders demagogues. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, it sounds insulting, but I had to be honest with you guys. I'm like, I, I don't really understand what that word means. It sounds like a dictator, right? But is it a dictator? Not really. The origin of the word comes from the 1640s, which is from originally, I guess, ancient Greeks before that. And and the the origin from, I guess, three or 400 years ago means an unprincipled popular orator or leader, one who seeks to obtain political power by pandering to the prejudices, wishes, ignorance, and passions of the people or part of them. Okay, where did this word come from? Well, demos, D-E-M-O-S, comes from common people, okay, in Greek origin, and the word agogos, or A-G-O-G-O-S, means to lead, or to drive, or draw out. Demagogue, an unprincipled popular orator or leader, is this chapter's word of the chapter. Well, we've come to another bittersweet end. It's always bittersweet, because we got to wait for that darn moon to get full again now. Okay. It's new moon time now. And, and, you know, M- Mitch album was over on the full moon. So our next guest in chapter 17 is going to be full, full moon, a full moon guest. So we, so we separate them. I don't know. Uh, full moon guest, new moon guest. I don't know. Which would you rather be? Which would you rather be? Maybe the full moon. Cause you can't even see the new moon, but it's the only time you can't see the moon. Interesting thing for like one minute, technically. Um, where was I? Well, I'm trying to close this thing off. It is a bittersweet finish as it is every chapter. I love talking with you, sharing with you, listening to you. Please give me a call. one 833 read a lot I listen to every single voicemail that comes in and I love the connection that we are forming. This is a really special place for me and I hope it is a special place for you too. Until next time, you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning the page and I'll talk to you soon.